The sounds of battle roar all around you. Steel clashing against steel, splintered wood, screaming voices. The flash of the arcane and the flame of the divine bathe all in mystic light. The ebb and flow of conflict can be a picture painted with words, words that suck you in, a tale woven by a master storyteller. There's magic to it. Those words conjure an image in your mind. But in this game, we can provide even more. Stone walls, old wooden doors, heroes slowly making their way through a dank hallway, near the end of which is a room that contains unspeakable horrors. These heroes, villains, and even walls and floors are more than just your imagination, but something you can look at and feel. Role-playing games are played on multiple levels. There's the world that the DM creates, the world we imagine in our minds as players, and the tiny physical representations some of us use to make the world a little bit more tangible. This little hobby within our hobby. So let's go on a little journey and discuss the utilization, pros and cons in history, of miniatures in TTRPGs. Part 1. Toy Soldiers, All in a Row. One could argue that miniatures are as old as gaming itself. They would be wrong, but that never stops folks from spouting garbage. Just look at Twitter. Looking at ancient games, chess could arguably be thought of as a miniature war game. You have pieces that represent various military units who fight their war on a board. I relish in this because I feel it is technically correct. And as a lawyer, technically correct is the most delicious form of correct. But I think that's not really what people mean when they think of miniatures being used in a game. Heck, I don't even think most people think of chess as a war game. And I'm not here to argue about that little quibble. I could, but to be honest, I don't feel like it. I don't know. Chess is cool. I liked Queen's Gambit. Searching for Bobby Fischer was a cool movie. Actual Bobby Fischer, not cool. But war games, real war games, like the ones we think about now, started, where else? In Prussia. As a heads up, Prussia is basically Germany before Germany was a thing. Germany as a country has only existed for about 150 years. Prior to that, it was known as Prussia and a number of other smaller nations until it unified in 1871. This is a massive oversimplification. So in the early 19th century, wargaming was stuck in this chess-like foundation. Square spaces on a board. Some efforts were made to make realistic terrain, but they still had to conform to the square board structure. That was until some Prussian nobles got involved. I am abstaining from naming names, because whenever I attempt to speak German, I get the names wrong and I sound like I'm attacking a butterfly with a vocal chainsaw. It's disrespectful to everyone involved. Now these games were made with small rectangular pieces as representations of the troops on the field. This was the way war games were played until about the turn of the century. The 20th century. Toy soldiers have been made throughout history by various cultures and continue to be made today. But the key moment is here. Tiny military history was being made in not quite Germany. Why is it always the Germans? So in 1775, while the United States was beginning its revolution, because the American Revolution started in 1775, not in 1776, like people were already fighting and dying when those guys were meeting and writing up the Declaration of Independence. The war was going on for over a year. It was just a bunch of rich landowners debating whether or not they wanted to declare independence, while poor farmers were dying in the fight already. Where was I? Oh, yeah, Germany. So, in 1775, Johann Gottfried Hilpert and his brother Johann Georg Hilpert set up a model soldier toy workshop in Nuremberg. They made these from tin and lead. So don't eat them. They were popular in Germany, but they really took off in Great Britain. Over there, some kids who played with those toys got a little older and thought about incorporating them into their games of Kriegspiel. Folks like Robert Louis Stevenson. Yeah, that guy. Who transformed his entire attic into a massive gaming room. What started as a game with just some tin soldiers all in a row ended up being an elaborate map that spanned the room with various terrain features and hundreds of toy soldiers marching on behalf of fictional countries through fictional cities. To replicate artillery, they got cork pop guns and shot them at the other side soldiers, which is objectively amazing. This game brought Stevenson and his new stepson closer together, easing the bonds of this newly formed family. 
Because gaming is a way to grow positive relationships. Because gaming is a way to grow positive relationships. Because gaming is a way... So we start seeing the toys and the gaming come together. And another gentleman of letters, H.G. Wells, publishes a new game. Little Wars. Or the full title, Little Wars, a game for boys from 12 years of age to 150, and for that more intelligent sort of girl who likes boys' games and books. Yikes. So we'll just call that Little Wars, right? Yeah, just Little Wars from here on out. So Little Wars comes out in 1913, which seems like a fun little time to get into large-scale war games involving toys, as no major military events should happen anytime soon. Side note, if not for the fact that licensing is such an expensive and impenetrable thing for music on this platform, I would totally have had a little musical interlude here where you would see the Archduke Franz Ferdinand while I played the song Take Me Out by Franz Ferdinand in the background. Picture it, it would have been hilarious. It's worth noting that H.G. Wells was a pacifist. He hated war, and it seems like an inconsistency to some that he would create a war game, but I kind of feel this as well. Like, I love war games, and shooter games, and guns, and weapons, but just because I find something fascinating doesn't mean I endorse it. So, the game comes out, and miniature-based wargaming took off from there. It started as historical miniatures wargaming, usually with Napoleonics, and then moving on to other genres. Medieval war games sprung up with War Game of the Middle Ages and Ancient Times by Tony Bath, released in 1956. The wonderful thing about this is that the models came first, and the game was then inspired by it. Bath was a guy who got into miniatures and then eventually decided to put mechanics to how he played. I can relate to this, because it's basically how I got into Warhammer. To this day, I have never won a game of Warhammer. I I've won a game or two of A Song of Ice and Fire's miniatures game, but never Warhammer or Warhammer 40k. I am not good at games. Additionally, it is true of D&D as well. Certain monsters were created because of a line of cheap plastic toys that some folks were inspired using. So the Rust Monster, the Boule, the iconic Owl Bear were all made up because people at TSR were trying to figure out how to use these cheap toys. So Bath creates the first published medieval miniatures war game, and Gary Gygax cited it as the grandparent of the genre. So let's talk about a sense of scale with time here. We are less than 20 years removed from D&D, and we are just now getting the first medieval miniatures game. The genre's birth would lead to the creation of Chainmail, which was made by Jeff Perrin and Gary Gygax, which is explicitly a miniatures war game. I point that out because this is where we transition to D&D. It's also where the story gets really confusing. Part 2. The Miniatures Game. That isn't. So here we have Dave Arneson and Gary Gygax making a new game. It's descended from and requires the use of Chainmail, which is explicitly a miniatures war game. Explicit as to say it's written on the cover, not that other kind of explicit. Get your mind out of the gutter. But also in the Dungeons & Dragons original booklet, they call D&D a fantasy medieval war game playable with paper, pencil, and miniature figures. So they used miniature figures in 1974, right? Well. Not according to Gary Gygax. I don't usually employ miniatures in my RPG play. We cease that when we move from Chainmail Fantasy to D&D. Wait, what? But don't you need to use Chainmail rules to play D&D? Wouldn't that necessitate using miniatures as it is a miniatures game? Actually, no. While it's recommended to have a copy of Chainmail to play D&D, it wasn't actually required. It was a bit of a shock to me when I was reading through the D&D rulebook from 1974. It has been repeated so much throughout the years that I just took it as a given. But when I read that Gygax didn't use minis, I resolved to check it out myself. While crude and not as well written as modern rules, you could definitely play this game without minis. It says so in the book, too. It is relatively simple to set up a fantasy campaign, and better still, it will cost almost nothing. In fact, you will not even need miniature figures. Some spells reference it, and there were some tables for morale that you may use, but it was more optional than required. The mechanics of the original game didn't really require miniatures at all to play, so they didn't really use miniatures in the beginning. In fact, Gygax said that the majority of players didn't use any visual aids for the first two years of play. The start of the miniatures movement, per Gygax himself, didn't begin until 1976. So hey, two points for the theater of the mind, folks. <laughs> 
But then, Gygax continues, and states that there are obvious benefits to the use of miniatures. So hey, two million points for the folks that use minis. Why? Because I made the rules up. Yeah. But once D&D left Wisconsin, folks around the country were playing, and the support of minis was on the rise. So while companies were making minis that catered to the D&D audience, like Raupartha or Heritage Miniatures, D&D didn't have an official line of minis. That is, until Minifigs made these little guys in 1977. It's a set of orcs orcs are the best. Now they aren't really easy to paint or as carefully crafted as the ones we have today, but they do the work. After this, Heritage made a line of miniatures for D&D from about 1979 to 1982. During that time, Grenadier Miniatures also made some official minis. Then in 1983, TSR tried to produce their own, but not being an actual miniatures producing company, these minis were generally regarded as garbage, and broke a lot. Then in 1985, they contracted Citadel Miniatures out of the UK, who made much better minis. So good were their minis, in fact, that the parent company made a fantasy miniatures war game out of it. I've heard it's pretty good. It's called Warhammer. After Citadel, Ral Partha took over for a long period of time, making minis until TSR was sold to Wizards of the Coast, at which point WotC started producing figures for a little while before the duties fell to WizKids, who still produce the official D&D miniatures to this day. Now, there are tons of different ways to collect miniatures for a game that, by its own creator's admission and playstyle, never even used them. Part 3. The Mind's Eye. First things first, I'm the eldest. Wait, no. Uh, first thing, I'm not a professional educator. I have a minor in psychology, and that's about it. If I make any misrepresentations on the research here, the fault is entirely mine. I implore you, as always, to do your own research and fact check anything I'm saying. I don't know a single Theater of the Mind player who ran a combat situation in a game like D&D or some other combat-heavy game that hasn't run into this problem at least once in their gaming sessions. You describe the room, folks are starting to declare their attacks, and you end up spending a lot of time trying to describe the specific details to ensure that everyone knows where everyone else is. Then after a round or two, someone forgets a detail, or you get a question like, well, where is this monster, or whatever. But the only person with an accurate map is the GM, in their minds. Look, I'm not saying that you need to have a tactical map with Dread or Alice is Missing, but if you're running an RPG with the tactical element, it's really helpful. Visual descriptions of a narrative can form mental images, and the use of visual models add to the vividness of this mental image. It can ease the construction of a clear mental image and enhance the memory, both by adding a sensory input and being a clear reminder on the table where people are. I think that folks think that representation on the table with minis and models and maps replaces the imagination and thus creates a feeling of playing a board game as opposed to the supposed pure of the imagined experience, but there isn't much research to support that, it's just a gut feeling. From what I can tell, it appears that folks prefer different communications. How many people like getting text messages as opposed to a phone call? My spouse hates phone calls. Having the text is much preferred. For many autistic folks, this is a very common issue. Strong preferences for text-based communication rather than a phone call. Yet, there are others who love calling and hate text messages. Preferences matter a lot. If you like the campfire story aspect of the theater of the mind, and don't like the gamey aspects of the figures on a grid, that's fair. Personally, I don't mind the reminder that this is a game. For me, that's part of the benefit. But that's not the whole story. For some folks, it is extraordinarily helpful to have grids and a mini. Now, I'm going to speak about some generalities here, and you should always take that with a grain of salt. I'll repeat a phrase that a friend of mine had told me about interacting or talking to autistic people. If you meet one autistic person, you've met one autistic person. No group is a monolith, and it helps to communicate with folks to understand their preferences. That said, some of the research I did seems to indicate that some autistic people can struggle with verbally communicated descriptions of an activity, situations, or events. The use of visual supports is incredibly common with autistic children especially. I've even spoken to some about the difficulty in understanding verbal descriptions when it comes to picturing a room. And I know neurotypical folks who are unable to judge distances or measurements 
just using their minds. That's not even to mention folks with aphantasia, or the inability to form a mental image. Multiple studies have indicated around 4% of the population have aphantasia, and either cannot form a mental image, or have a mental image that is dimmed or blurred. For them, the visual depiction of the scene adds to the fun, as their mental image may not be clear. I discuss this not because I'm trying to convert you to the cult of minis. I mean, you should join the cult of minis, but that's not the point. But accessibility is not something we always think about in gaming. But it is something to consider. We should be thinking about this. We generally don't engage with accessibility until we're confronted with it and it hits us in the face. And even when it's considered, most of the time it's sorely lacking. I've always found that tabletop RPGs to be a way to include people, and the use of miniatures may help help people get into this wonderful little hobby of ours. Part 4. Toy Joy I remember being in high school, I think it was like a freshman, when I had a puddle of Legos on my bed. I made some sort of intricate battle tank that was a replica of the British Mark VIII tank from World War I. Sort of. It was actually the tank from Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, which was a Mark VIII tank with a turret on the top of it to make it look a little bit more modern. Then I had some Lego minifigs that had rifles from the Fort Legorado set that I had gotten for Christmas a few years prior. As a side note, we bought that brand new for like $85 in 1990s money, and while writing this script I was looking up that set and it sells for something like two Two grand on Amazon. Wow! So anyway, I took an X-Acto knife to the iron sights at the top of that gun so I could put some stuff on it and make the guns look futuristic. The soldiers were wearing armor from the medieval set with helmets from like a space set that I had. It was awesome. I, I was living the dream, folks. Living the dream. Well, my father comes in and hits me with this Bible quote. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Well, I'm nearly 40 now, and to my father, I say, you, Dad. To be clear, I mean this about the situation specifically. Much love to you and Mom. I'll probably see you around St. Patrick's Day. As modern studies show, playfulness and adult play are wildly beneficial for physical and mental health. Science tells us to discard the notion that play and silliness and imaginative games are for children only. They benefit children as well, helping with socialization and relationship building, but they also benefit us as adults. We see our language change when we discuss things. It's the classic doll versus action figure wordplay. But look at this thing. You can call it a model. You can call it a little piece of art. You can call it a miniature. But you can also call it a toy. Because it is a toy. Many things can be toys. I tend to think about my computer that I'm editing this video on as a toy. A toy that can also play silly shooter games. Yes, I play shooter games. Yes, I'm for gun legislation. No, I don't think that's hypocritical. I was watching a prominent streamer playing a shooter game, and someone in chat asked him if he owned a gun. He said no, and that he didn't see how his love of firearms in a game would track to any real-world desire to own a gun. Some people have expensive toys. Some people have toys that they make themselves. I have a watch collection. This is basically a toy box at this point. I don't like how toys have a negative connotation. Toys remind me of happiness. When I was younger, I didn't get a lot of toys. Generally, I got something like on my birthday and Christmas and that was about it. But I have such great memories with toys. Grabbing my Legos and creating stories and scenarios. Reliving movies and being creative while I smashed action figures together. I don't have a lot of bad memories with toys. Like, there was maybe that time where my brothers decided to ride my little sit and scoot toy, but they weighed too much for the plastic parts to hold them and it broke. Or that time I had a football-themed birthday cake with all these players on it, and then my brothers took my toys and gave me the kicker with one foot because the other foot had broken off. They didn't want to play with that one. Older brothers are the worst. Yeah, it's been like 30 years. I, I haven't let that go. <laughs> but toys generally gave me great memories. And I feel super old because I realized that the sit and scoot toy really isn't made anymore. I couldn't really find a great picture of it because it's a 35 year old toy. Uh, this is it in kimchi. Found it. When I search my phone's picture gallery for the word toy, the decision engine in the phone pulls up photos of my kids playing with their toys and an entire gallery of all the minis that I've painted. These are toys. I play with them as a grown man and my players get a kick out of it. Enjoy toys. I don't care how old you are. Play with a toy. Be sure to share and play nice with others, though. Part 5. That hobby within a hobby. So there are a couple of guides out there for how to get into miniatures. Uh, for me, I started with the Reaper Bone Starter Set. 
It was a group. Oop. <laughs> I started with the Reaper Bones starter paint set. It was a great introduction to the hobby of painting minis. I love using Games Workshop minis because they're really high quality. They're also really expensive. So I put myself on this like miniature purchasing pause because I have too big of a backlog and I was spending way too much money on minis. I warn you, it can get addicting. Also, I love Dark Sword miniatures as well. They're really well-crafted metal miniatures, some of which are based on some of your favorite D&D artists from back in the old days, like Larry Elmore. You probably heard about buying something like Massive Darkness or some other mini-intensive board games to get a bunch of fantasy minis on the cheap, and those are all great and nice solutions. But there is a problem. I have a really hard time finding reasonable female miniatures. It's also very difficult to find non-Eurocentric minis. Here are a few of my recommendations for getting those harder to find minis and expanding your collection's horizon. So I like using bad Squiddo games for my female minis. Look, if you are into sexy minis, more power to you, enjoy yourself. It's not really my thing. However, if you're looking for the type of minis that look like they're actually ready for a fight, this is a good place to start. I have a few of their minis and while it took some time to ship across an ocean, it was worth the wait. Or if you know about a place to get more minis like this, put it in the comments below. I'm always looking for it. In the realm of non-Eurocentric minis, I have two solutions. One is kind of obvious. Just paint them a different color. It's the simplest fix. It's surprisingly, it works a lot of the time. Second, historical miniatures. Historical miniatures are generally made by folks who are extremely inclined to ensure that every single detail on a mini is as close to historical accuracy as possible. They can generally tell you what color pants a Union artillery soldier in 1864 would use as opposed to the infantry. Historical side note, the pant color is actually the same, though the artillery soldier would have a distinctive red stripe going down the side of their legs, hence the nickname Red Leg, which actually endures in military circles to this day. So their attention to detail is generally really stellar. For instance, folks have asked where I got minis for my Korean warriors. I found these via Perry's Miniatures. Perry's is a company run by twin brothers, Alan and Michael Perry, who were former sculptors for Games Workshop. They were major contributors to the Lord of the Rings Miniatures War Game by Games Workshop, and actually appeared in the Return of the Kings movie. Michael is also disabled, having severely injured his dominant right hand during a reenactment of the Battle of Cressy, and actually losing part of his arm. He taught himself to paint and sculpt with his left hand. They have many historical lines, which showcase various Napoleonic Wars. There's also a line of minis for the Crusades era that depicts Muslim warriors during the age, and also a late 16th century Japanese warriors and samurais and Korean warriors of the Imjin War. I have quite a few Korean minis from them, and I'm very happy with it. They also have a line of Mahdist Sudanese warriors from the English Sudanese War, Afghan warriors, and a solid line of Zulu warriors. I was running an RPG campaign, and one of my best friends who was playing in it was born and raised in Africa. He saw the Zulu minis and and immediately gravitated towards it. He loved them. You can probably find other cultures as well, like Native American or Indian or Aztec. You have to be a little careful though. Some of these are not necessarily from the most progressive artists, but the good ones are diligent about their attention to historical accuracy, going so far as to provide books that will give you the historical background of the conflicts and the cultures involved if you're so inclined to read them. The primary issue that I have with historical miniatures is of all the ones that I've found, they are almost all of a singular gender. They're all men. It is incredibly hard to find women represented in historical miniatures. Outside of that, there's always places like Heroforge that allow a level of customization, but usually lacks a lot of features from various other cultures outside of the bog standard European fantasy or a light offering of Japanese or Chinese clothing or weapons. I really want there to be more that I could showcase, but I haven't found much. Please, please, please comment down below with companies that you know of that make minis outside of the Eurocentric male fantasy miniatures. I'm all always looking for new stuff. Lastly, there's 3D printing. I kind of hesitated to mention this because it's kind of pricey to get into 3D printing, and I still haven't found much out there. I think I found one mythic Korean miniatures line. It's an option, and if you can learn how to sculpt minis through Blender or some other free software, you can also make them on your own. Good luck to you. If you do, I may buy some STL files from you. Put those in the comment section as well. I am constantly looking to add to my pile of shame the growing boxes of unpainted minis that I have. Unpainted because I keep making these videos for you people. Conclusion.
ultimately I'm for the promotion of joy and fun. I know there's a lot of folks out there who don't like the use of minis in their games. I understand that. I was once as you are now. I love war games. I love toys. I love tactical combat in my RPGs. But there are a ton of RPGs out there where having minis or a visual representation doesn't really fit the nature of the game. And to be honest, I don't even have a callback to a bygone age during my childhood where I played with minis. I got into miniatures around 34 years old. In many ways, to get into minis can get very expensive. Prohibitively expensive. There are ways to cut costs and to do it on the cheap, but it's a time and money consuming hobby. You buy paints and wet palettes and sometimes you can pay over it for a single mini, but it looks so cool when your players face it and the big boy comes on the table and they scream in terror. But I went through this hobby for over 20 years without touching a mini. A friend of mine egged me on over the course of months and years to get just the little mini starter set. The painting process I found was meditative, and the fun of plopping a terrifying monster in front of your players was amazing. The joy of seeing the excitement the mini elicited from their faces it reminded me of when I was a kid playing with toys. I truly believe that it isn't just a feeling for memories. It should be a feeling that is felt in the present. So enjoy yourself and go play with some toys. Thanks for watching. I love war games and sh- Oh, I did- I messed that whole paragraph up. Ultimately, I'm for the-